Hi guys, welcome to our channel. This is Science Lectures. Please consider subscribing and hit the, the like button. Then you hit the notification bell just in case we have anything we can we can tell we can inform you. So today we are going to look at secondary active transport, and uh, we are still continuing with our series of transport under cell biology. So today we are looking at secondary active transport. Last time we had a video about primary active transport, so you please check it out. So today we are dealing with secondary active transport. Remember we said, to take you back, uh, first of all we defined what active transport is. Active transport, and we said transport of molecules from a region of their low concentration, low concentration to a region of their high concentration. High concentration with the aid of energy in form of ATP, with the aid of energy in form of ATP, and again is the concentration gradient. Again is the concentration gradient. So just a brief recap. Then we say active transport is divided into two. That is primary active transport and secondary active transport. And we say primary active transport is where we use energy in form of ATP directly. So we said here energy will be used directly in form of ATP. Now we are going to see how they differ primary and secondary active transport. So let's start off with um, secondary active transport. But before we start off with secondary active transport, uh, we need to have the concept of the sodium potassium pump, uh, the sodium stroke potassium pump, or it depends pump. So we need to have an idea about this pump. We say this pump uses energy in form of ATP directly, and we say it ensures that if this is a cell, there is pumping out of three sodium ions for every two potassium ions that are pumped in. This is what we say in a primary active transport under the sodium potassium pump. Why is this important? When we pump out sodium ions, their concentration increases outside the cell. So they are more, let's take it that they are more sodium ions outside the cell, high concentration of high sodium ions outside the cell. So in secondary active transport, we will use the sodium potassium pump to transport, to aid in transport of molecules like glucose. So let's imagine after primary active transport, sodium potassium pump, we have more sodium ions outside the cell. These sodium ions will provide the energy that we transport other molecules like glucose into the cell. So if this is a high concentration of sodium ions and their transportation back into the cell will also lead to transportation of molecules like glucose. And that is basically a brief introduction about secondary active transport. So in secondary active transport, we are using ATP, but we are used indirectly. We indirectly use ATP. How? Because in primary active transport, sodium potassium pump, we use ATP to pump out three sodium ions for every two potassium ions pumped in. And this created a high concentration gradient of sodium ions which in turn provides energy for transport of other molecules like let's say glucose or hydrogen ions or amino acids being transported. So this is, this is something which is very key. It's a, a key concept in, um, in active, secondary active transport. So this is the basis. So that implies that what we need to note and be uh, the sodium potassium pump is a basis, a basis for secondary active transport. So minus the sodium potassium pump, secondary trans, secondary active transport might not be effective. Secondary active transport. So the sodium potassium pump is a basis for secondary active transport. And that is how it happens by increasing the concentration gradient of sodium ions, which later create energy for transportation of other molecules, like let's say glucose. So uh, let's look, let's have a look at some examples of, um, of, of what is involved in secondary active transport. Some examples of secondary active transport. Um, examples of secondary active transport. 
Mm, and maybe another thing we need to note before we look at the examples is that secondary active transport uses carriers. So we need carriers. Remember, in primary active transport, we were utilizing pumps. There was utilization of pumps. But in this case, we are going to use carriers that will aid in transportation of these molecules. So example number one in secondary active transport is um, the sodium 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 glucose uh, the sodium glucose sodium glucose co-transporter sodium glucose co-transport is our number one example but again sorry before we look at this example we need to know that active transport via the carrier let's say this is our carrier can happen in a format which is um, where we have two molecules moving in the same direction or we can have two molecules if this is our carrier or we can have two molecules moving in opposite directions if we have two molecules moving in the same direction, let's say inside the cell, this is what we refer to as symbot. 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 Then if we have one molecule moving, molecules moving in different directions, that is what we call antipot. Antipot. So symbot, two molecules moving in the same direction. Antipot molecules moving in different direction, but again, <coughs> symbot can also be referred to as um, we can also refer to it, it as co-transport, co-transport. Then antipot can be referred to as counter transport, counter transport. So co-transport, counter transport, co-transport molecules moving in the same direction. That is symbot, antipot moving in different directions. That's why we are having one molecule entering, one molecule exiting the cell. So this one is also an important concept before we proceed. And uh, then let's deal with our example, the sodium glucose co-transport. So sodium glucose co-transport, this one is found in the, in the kidneys, in the kidney tubules, uh, basically the proximal computed tubules in the kidney so this one is located these pumps are located in, these carriers are located in the kidney what will happen with the carriers let's say this is our carrier and we are having the lumen let's say outside here is the lumen of the proximal computer tubule and it has um high concept it has sodium ions in high concentration outside after primary active transport, of course, we have excess of sodium ions. Then we have um, glucose. But in this case, glucose in the lumen is in a low, a low concentration. So we have a low concentration of glucose in the lumen, but a high concentration of um, sodium ions there. So when the sodium ions are being transported into, into the, back into the body, also glucose will be transported back into the body. So sodium ions, high concentration gradient moving from, from the lumen back into the body. Then glucose moving from the lumen where it is in a low concentration to the body where it is in a high concentration. So that is it for, uh, that is basically a building block for sodium glucose co-transport. But again, <coughs> um, an application, we can have an application in the body Let's say we are having a patient who is, let's say we are having a diabetic patient, a diabetic patient, we can alter this, uh, the pump, sorry, this carrier, we can alter, yeah, we can alter the pump, the sodium potassium pump of this diabetic patient. Um, if we give drugs like, um, like, let's say we have a drug like empagliflozin, so this drug, how this drug will work is that it will inhibit the sodium potassium pump and when it inhibits the sodium potassium pump, less glucose will be absorbed back into the body in diabetic patients and they will end up releasing 
a lot of glucose in their urine. So that reduces the concentration of glucose in the body. Let's proceed with the next um, example of secondary active transport, and that is the sodium, the sodium iron stroke potassium stroke uh, two chloride co-transport. Co-transport. So this is another pump. In secondary under secondary active transport. So we have the it is called the sodium potassium to chloride co transport or simporter or simport. So in this one we'll have um, our carrier molecule. They say this is uh, this is the carrier. So let me state it again. Uh, this is they say this is the carrier and it so this is what will happen. So we are saying it is simple. So molecules are moving in the same direction. Co-transport or simple, or it is a simple Simple There are four molecules are moving in the same direction. So let's say we are having a high concentration of sodium ions outside. Sodium ions, sodium ions. They will be transported along with the potassium ions and the chloride ions back into back into the cell. So let's imagine this is the lumen. Let's just say this is the lumen. This is the lumen of our kidney tubules. Let's say it is the lumen of the loop of Henry. Loop of Henry. So the lumen of the loop of Henry will have a concentration of sodium ions that is much in the lumen. Because they, they are being pumped, let's imagine they are being pumped by primary active transport. So they are high in concentration in the lumen. Then um, potassium, we have few ions and chloride, few ions. Because we are transporting a molecule, we are transporting these two from a region of their low concentration to a region of their high concentration. So from the lumen of these tubules back into the body, back into the body. So, <clears throat> But the driving force is created by the sodium ions, like we described at the start of the video. So these loops are, sorry, these um, these pumps are common in the loop of Henry, and the loop of Henry we know that it is in our kidney tubules. So they are common in the loop of Henry. So how is this very relevant? What happens when we block this the sodium potassium pump in this case? So there are drugs um, drugs called loop diuretics. Loop diuretics, loop diuretics, and loop diuretics are drugs that will reduce the quantity of water in one's body. Let's say we have a patient who has a, a condition like edema, excess water in the in the tissues, tissue fluid. Let's say we are having a patient with ascites, ascites, and we need to remove to drain the excess water. We'll give loop diuretics, and loop diuretics will inhibit the action of this pump. Now when this pump is inhibited, limited ions or no ions will be taken back to the body. When these ions are being taken back to the body, they carry water molecules along with them. So let's just make it more practical here. Let's say we are having sodium ions and we are having the potassium ions there and the chloride ions present. So when sodium ions are entering also Potassium ions are transported along and chloride ions are transported along. But as they are transported, these two ions will carry water along with them. Water along with them. The more they are transported back into the body from the from the loop of Henry, the more they take clean water. So if you block the action of the sodium potassium pump, you're blocking the transportation of these ions back into the body, and the patient and the person will end up losing. A lot of water. That is what loop diuretics do. Drugs that are loop diuretics. An example is the famous Lasix, which is known as furosemide. Furosemide. So that is how the sodium potassium to chloride or transport will operate. We'll have sodium ions high concentration outside there. They will provide the energy that drives transportation of potassium and chloride ions into back into the body and um, when they are back into the body they can transport water along with them blocking this and uh, this um carry this the pump which is which is located in the in the loop of Henry will 
increase the rate of increase of water from the body. So, so let's look at the third, the third, the, the third example under secondary active transport. But this time we are going to look at an antiporter. Antiporter for what we call counter transport. So we are going to have a look at examples in counter transport where we have molecules transported in different directions. So we'll start off with uh, the sodium, the sodium hydrogen counter transport or antiport counter transport sodium hydrogen counter transport. So the, the, this this one is found in the histoconjunctive tubule of uh, the kidney, of course, the kidney. Kidney, but specifically in the distal convoluted tubules of the kidney. So this pump, uh, the pump works like, uh, if let's say if this is in fact the carrier, if this is our carrier, and we have sodium ions in excess, sodium ions. After primary active transport, we have a yield of excess sodium ions, of many sodium ions there. And, um, so we are transporting hydrogen ions in the opposite direction. Hydrogen ions in the opposite direction. So these are hydrogen ions going in the opposite direction. Hydrogen then is in sodium transported to this direction. Sodium ions transported to that direction. Hydrogen ions to that direction. So in the distal computed tubule, and now this will be the lumen. Let's imagine this is the lumen of our distal computed tubule. Then um, this is the let's say this is let me just call this the body system back into the body. So if this is the lumen and we are having sodium ions entering um, as hydrogen ions leave, they will go into the lumen of the distal computer tube and they will be excreted. So how is this? Um, how can we apply this um, to a more practical approach? Let's imagine uh, someone whose body is containing excess of this hormone. Aldosterone, aldosterone hormone, and we know aldosterone hormone is capable of producing sodium ions in excess. So let's imagine you have excess of sodium ions, and your primary active transport pump is very active. In other words, your primary active transport pump has more of the sodium. If you have more of the sodium, if the pump is very active, now we have excess of sodium ions, and the pump is too active. What will happen is that the more the pump is active, the more hydrogen ions are going to be lost from the body. So, increase in activity of the pump, increase the activity of this pump will increase the loss, the exit of um, the hydrogen ions because they work in an antagonistic way. When one is into the body, the other exits the body into the lumen of the distal computer. So, <clears throat> increase in activity will increase the loss of hydrogen ions. And the excessive loss of hydrogen ions in our body causes a condition called metabolic alkalosis. Metabolic alkalosis. And the opposite will happen when the pumps are not that active. When the pumps are not very active, we'll have. Um, Limited, limited hydrogen ions leaving the body and excess hydrogen ions will remain in the body, resulting in what we call acidic, um, an acidic condition in the body, like the one we call um, metabolic acidosis. So you can find individuals developing metabolic acidosis just because of altering of the normal working of this pump. So that is that is how secondary active transport is very important. So this is antiport counter transport, sodium hydrogen counter transport. Uh, we in the distal completed tubule, sodium entering as hydrogen ions are exiting the body, going into the lumen of the distal completed, and we say over over activity of the sodium of the sodium potassium pumps. So sorry, sodium hydrogen pumps over sodium proton pump will will lead to a condition called metabolic alkalosis because we have excess readings 
of the of the hydrogen ion from the body. And the opposite happens when the pump is not working in the way it should work effectively. So that is it for sodium hydrogen. Okay. So let's look at the third, the fourth, the fourth, the fourth example under secondary active transport, and uh, this will be the sodium is the sodium what the sodium calcium antiponta so the sodium calcium antiponta or sodium calcium counter transport so it's sodium calcium counter transport so this will be our fourth one under secondary active transport and the sodium calcium counter transport we can, let's make it more practical let's say we are having our carrier moiety and we have let's say this, these are sodium ions entering from their high concentration gradient sodium ions sodium ions let's say these are due to the fact that it is a counter transport or antiport system let's imagine we are having the calcium ions here getting out so such, such a pump can be found in the cardiac muscle, cardiac muscles, the muscles of the heart, cardiac muscles of the heart. So what happens in such a pump? Sodium ions, as sodium ions are entering, as if this is the cardiac muscle, the inside of the cardiac muscle, cardiac muscle inside, inside of the cardiac muscle, as sodium ions are entering, calcium ions are moving out. And we know what calcium ions do. What are calcium ions for? They are used for muscle contraction. So if we want to effect muscle contraction, we need the calcium ions to be present. So what will happen when uh, such a scenario happens? When we have sodium ions entering and calcium ions leaving, that means the muscle will instead relax. So in relaxation of the cardiac muscle, we have sodium ions entering as calcium ions are leaving outside are leaving outside of this muscle and that will cause relaxation of the muscle not contraction of the muscle so how is this very important a drug called digoxin um, a drug digoxin that is used to manage heart failure conditions like heart failure where the heart fails to compensate for the needs of the body to pump effectively to compensate for the needs of the body the oxygen demands of the body a drug called digoxin will be applied to such patients, and digoxin inhibits the working of the sodium potassium pumps, which we say there are a basis for secondary active transport. They are supposed to yield sodium ions that will accumulate and aid in, in and they will listen. This is what, what, what the pumps will do increase sodium ions, the sodium potassium pump will increase sodium ions, and they will move along into the carrier and as calcium ions exit the cardiac muscle and when they exit that causes relaxation of the muscle but if we could give a drug like digoxin 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 will inhibit the working of this pump sodium ions will remain in the muscle and muscle contraction will be effected so there will be contraction of the cardiac muscle and this is how the drug can be used to manage heart failure because in heart failure the heart is the heart is not strong enough to generate to pump blood to all to the rest of the parts of the body that need to get needs like oxygen. So this is it basically for secondary active transport, and this is it for counter for counter transport.